For those of you that expected to see Pastor Craig today, here's Pastor Tim. And I am delighted. Well, before you cheer, our pastor's a bit under the weather. And uh, so uh, I got a text yesterday morning. I had a busy weekend. We had promise rehearsal. I had a funeral yesterday for one of our church family at 2 o'clock. And I've been living in my son's home because they're away. I, I've been dog-sitting the two dogs and a cat living downtown Traverse City and enjoying that. And I got the text and thought, oh. And then Craig said, anything you want. Don't, you don't have to do Isaiah 52. So I did go off text today, and I'm delighted. Uh, I kind of equate it to uh, being like the old man at the end of the bench on the baseball team, you know, and suddenly they like, you're on, get up there and pitch it. And and by the way, I checked, who is the oldest active player in baseball right now? Albert Pujols. So I kind of like the illustration that Los Angeles Angel player is going to be a future Hall of Famer. I thought, that's a good one. I like that. Anyway, um, instead... I want to talk to you about fear and sauntering. Let me read a quote. This is from John Muir, who is kind of like one of my personal heroes. He got the the first national park going at Yellowstone. This is his quote. I don't like the word hike or the thing. People ought to saunter in the mountains, not hike. Do you know the origin of the word saunter? It's a beautiful word. Way back in the Middle Ages, people used to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. By the way, one of my dreams is to go to Israel and hike the Jesus Trail. It starts off in Nazareth, and you walk all the way to Capernaum, and then you walk around the Sea of Galilee. Someday I'm going to send you pictures. Anyway, and, and when people in the villages uh, passed through, they passed along when they were going, they would reply, Allah, Santa, there. Something like that. My French is terrible. Anyway, and to the Holy Land. And so they became known as saunterers or saunters. Now, these mountains are our holy land, and we ought to saunter through them reverently, not hike through them. John Muir. Recently, uh, we hit some difficult terrain in our pilgrimage together, you and I. We sauntered through a global pandemic. The first thing I want to say that I've been thankful for in the midst of this is we've gone through it together. A trip together is better than a trip alone. I love to hike, by the way. I I see that one of my hiking buddies is here. He came in with the big white beard. Anyway, we hiked the Grand Canyon together this year, and it's better together. It really is when you take on a big challenge. And I think so. We needed to walk together. We needed to love one another, comfort one another, pray for one another, and walk together through that, which I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for your companionship. We have deepened our faith. We have walked with Jesus and prayed and refused to fear. I want to read you some scriptures. For God has not given us a spirit to fear, but a power, love, and self-control. Fellow pilgrims, can I call you that? Sojourners, saunters, you are a new creation in Christ. You have a new soul, a new spirit, and you have a new native tongue, and you do not speak the language of fear. Scripture is filled with verses on it. Philippians, do not be anxious about anything, anything. Put the word in there. First John, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out all fear. Aren't we thankful for that? Uh, Psalms is filled with references to fear. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my... This morning I woke up and I said, wait, I left out a great one. So it's written on the back of the page. Anyway, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And of course, I cannot leave out Isaiah. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. A few years back, I got invited to Nepal through the Timothy Project. And they were asking for Christian counselors from all over to go to different countries and provide uh, seasonal counseling for expats and missionaries that lived in the country. And I said yes. And they said, well, would you like to go to Nepal? Let's just go to the ends of the earth, right? So I went into Kathmandu and I went up into the Eastern Himalayas and I was there, there with in this resort way up in the mountains. Picture it, way up in the mountains, with giant mountains. You could look out and see the Annapurna Range. And uh, I'm up in the mountains and these people would sleep in to about 11 or 12 and I wasn't. I was from Michigan. I was on just a totally different time. And I didn't want to sleep in, so I would get up really early in the morning. And we had a lock gate there. And I would go out to the gate, and I would climb up over the gate and get out of the, the, the compound that we were at. And I would wander by myself into the, the city near there in Nepal. And, and I would just wander. Now, my rules for wandering or sauntering in a different country is just go in a straight line and walk back. Yeah, I, but as I wandered along, um, I, uh, I, I came across a trail that went straight up this little mountain there. And I looked at it and I said, I am going to hike that mountain. I'm going to get to the top of that thing because I'm crazy. So at about midnight one day, I got out, climbed up over the gate and went down to this trail, put my headlamp on. I am going to climb this mountain, right? And, and I started up it. And the weird part is I wasn't alone. There was about 40 or 50 people wandering with me. And normally Nepal people are very talkative and they have five or six words they know in English and they will use them on you over and over with and want to talk with you. But these people were on a mission. So partway up, we hit this giant, giant Buddha on the side of the mountain. And some of the people dropped off at the Buddha. There was a giant log. I mean, it was a log on a rope that they would take and swing and hit that bell. Boom, a bong, boom. It, it was so impressive. And, and then I, I kept going because I was going to the top of the mountain. And there was people still traveling. The most of them kept on the travel. What they were part of was a Hindu pilgrimage that morning that I had accidentally become part of, right? And your new whole pastor on the Hindu pilgrimage. And so I, I get to the top of the mountain and there is a Hindu temple up there built on the top of the town mountain to the goddess Kali. And you've all seen her. She's dark. She has three arms and one arm's a severed head, one arm's a sword. It's kind of tough to see in the morning. Anyway, and they were walking up and they were going to their gods. We don't have to do that. You are the temple of God. You are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Wherever you go, the church goes. Wherever you go, you can worship. You don't have to go on a pilgrimage to an idol. <sighs> If you were under hospice care and I was asked to come see you, which happens to me very often, because that's what I do for this church family since March 1, 2000, is do pastoral care. I would come in to you, and this happened to me recently. Somebody was in the hospital and they were moving the vents. And I held his hand, prayed over him, sung a song, he didn't complain. Anyway, and then I prayed Psalm 23 in his ear. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. They anointeth my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell, water, in the house of the Lord forever. I whispered it into his ears as he died. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, if you stop right there, you should fear. You should have a nervous breakdown. You should have panic attacks and get a nervous twitch. If we are left to face the valley of the shadow of death on our own, we're in giant trouble. But the verse doesn't end like that. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Aren't we thankful for that? Yes. Who's your hiking buddy? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Who's your hiking buddy? I want to hear with confidence. Let me read to this. You have a hiking buddy that is God, that is Jesus Christ. Your traveling companion is the King of Kings, Emmanuel, God with us, the Word, the Messiah, uh, the Anointed One, the Almighty, the Author of Life, the Bread of Life, our Deliverer, the Good Shepherd, the Hope of Glory, the Lamb of God without blemish, the Light of the Real, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, Mighty God, the Righteous Brand, Savior, and the Friend of Sinners. Are we thankful for that? That's who you're walking with. I apologize for how fast I talked right there. Anyway, it's easy till you have to sign it. Anyway, that changes everything. That changes everything. Who are you walking with? Do you want to be changed? Amen. Walk with Jesus. Let's talk about the men on the road to Emmaus, those pilgrims that had come to the temple for Passover. Let's, let's talk about what was happening prior to their arrival. Uh, they say in Jesus' time, upwards of a million people would walk uphill. If you've been to Jerusalem, to the temple, it's uphill all the way. They would walk uphill. They would come from every little town and every little community, and they would walk. And, and as they walked and got closer and closer to the time of Passover, the, gra- the crowd swelled and swelled and swelled until they entered the town together. As they walked along, they would as you would on the Appalachian Trail or any other place, start talking with each other and worshiping each other and singing the songs of ascent as they walked up little by little by little and it got more exciting and more exciting and more exciting as they got into the temple. And you know what? Uh, The last one they would sing is, blessed is he who comes in what? The name of the Lord. But as they walked along, they realized that they were walking with the Messiah. And when they entered, they threw down clothes. They threw down branches. By the way, there's one other reference in the Bible where they throw down clothes. If you were going to pick out the worst king in the Bible, who would you pick it out? Ahab, come on, King Ahab. He was terrible, awful, bell worshiper, terrible in the And he had a worse wife. Anyway, Jezebel. God said, I'm done with him. Go anoint a new king, Jehu. They anointed Jehu and all of his people standing around immediately took off their garments and threw it on the ground and let the new king. Jesus is a new and better Jehu that replaced the evil darkness of this life. That's what was happening. They threw down their clothes. They threw down their branches. They were worshiping the king of kings. And then he got crucified and they were depressed and were walking home going, what just happened? Then somebody joined them, just like what would normally happen. A couple saunterers walking along in kind of a bad, sad mood. Another one joins them. He goes, what's your problem? They go, what, you're the only person who doesn't know? And then they tell him the problem. I'm reading it to you out of the message from Luke 24 because he, it is so funny. 
Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted. By the way, if you were just walking along the trail with somebody and you started talking and they called you thick-headed, I might slow down or speed up or something. i got to take my lunch break. Anyway, why can't you simply believe all that the prophet said? Don't you see these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer, or only then enter into his glory? Then he started at the beginning with the book of Moses and went through all the prophets, which would have included Isaiah, as we have seen over and over again with this message series that he pointed to the Messiah, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. They came to the edge of the village, Where they were headed, he acted as if he was going on, but they pressed him. Stay here, supper with us. It's nearly evening, the day is gone. You know, stay here in Emmaus. So he went in with them, and here is what happened. He sat down at the table with them, taking the bread. He blessed and broke and gave it to them. And at the moment, they were open-eyed, wide-eyed, and they recognized him. It's Jesus! Why did they recognize him? Because they had walked into town with them. And they were getting to walk out of town with them. The resurrected Savior. And then he disappeared. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures for us? Do you want to be changed? Walk with Jesus. Pilgrims. Fear is not your native language. Fear is not on your tongues. Believers, fellow Christians, we are not called to be stressed out and panicked. We will not fear. We walk with Jesus. In the promise, a while back, I got to be the narrator for years. And one of the things I would keep telling myself is keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of your faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And I got to do that. And I tell you believers during this time, this season in our life, through all your life, keep your eyes on Jesus. It's Jesus' triumphal entry. I want to read this to you. They say this in Luke 19. Right at the crest where the Mount of Olives begins its descent, the whole crowd of disciples burst into enthusiastic praise. I'm going back to the triumphal entry over the mighty works that they had witnessed. Why were they praising the Messiah? They had walked with him. And they had saw, they'd saw Lazarus raised from the death only a week ago in Bethany. And they had seen miracle after miracle. And, and they now realized, do you want to know one of the biggest, most evil works of Satan? He wants you to forget the mighty works of God. God has been for you, is for you, and will be for you. God has done great things in your life. God has answered prayer. God has been there with you. But Satan wants you to forget all of that so when something happens, you start from zero. We don't believe ours. We start on a mountain of truth built up with miracles, hope, and faith. And we do not speak what? The language of fear. We do not speak the language of fear. By the way, Passover this year. It's an historical event, right? Jesus was going for the Passover. It begins on Saturday, March 27th. Very soon. And ends on Sunday, April 4th. What day is that this year? It's matching up. I'm so excited. I'm like a history nerd, okay? This is cool. That's the way it should be. If you want to make this the most spectacular, amazing uh, resurrection season of your life. Walk with Jesus. Walk with him. 
Study him. Your pastor has asked you to go through all the different uh, gospels. Go through those gospels. See Jesus. Fall in love with him. And this holy season, it will be powerful. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. I am hoping that you can't get that out of your brains for the rest of your life. God is with you. God is with you. They were bursting into enthusiastic praise because we are witnesses. We are bursting in. I can't read my own writing. We are bursting into enthusiastic praise because we are witnesses of the mighty works of God. That's why we praise him. If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Kings. I've always thought that Psalm 23 and 2 Kings ought to be tied together. You know the story. The story goes like this. The Syrians are attacking Israel, but they're not getting away with it. Somehow the Israelites always know. So the king of Syria, being the paranoid guy he is, accuses his own people of spying. And they say, no, we're not spying. The prophet is telling them. And then so he sends an army dispatch. I'm going to start in verse 17. And I just want to um, read this to you. Oh, wait, I want to start in verse 15. Here we go. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. They had sent their best warriors and tanks and you know whatever they had that was the best technology of war back in those days, the horses and chariots. And this is the response of the sermon. It says, oh my Lord, what shall we do? You know what? When we're facing a pandemic without God, when we're facing cancer without God, when we're facing sickness without God, financial distress, whatever it may be without God, you know what we should do? We should we should bring God in. I was getting a little more pagan before that moment. Anyway, we should panic. We should fear. We should be upset. Ah! That's what the servant did. He's getting out there. He's going to make some breakfast for the prophet. He's opening up the can of full jars. He's looking out and going, no. Look at all those horses. He should have said pretty horses, but no, he's going, no. We got spears and swords and chariots. We're doomed, doomed, doomed. Have you heard anything like that recently? If you said no, you you haven't turned your TV on for a while, then I praise you. Anyway, (laughs) they had big problems like horses and chariots waiting to seize them. The only good reaction would have been to completely panic if you didn't know God. The servant was about to ask some dumb questions. What shall we do? Right? You're completely surrounded by the SWAT team, right? (laughs) What shall we do? Raise your hands. You're right. You got all those little red dots on you. Up. Anyway. Well, if we were stupid, we would run out like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid and charge the chariots. Going out in a hell of glory, right? If we were depressed, well, we'd stay inside the place, panic, get drunk, smoke pot, and eat and eat and eat our pandemic away. (laughs) C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says, Human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy or solve his problems or get him out of his troubles. Elisha prayed, prayed in verse 17, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. That's a prayer that we need to pray. First of all, We need to pray it for others. 
Pick somebody right now that's a believer that is, needs some eye opening. They're under panic. Pick somebody that maybe isn't even a believer that God would completely raise them from the dead, dead unto life. Pray for that person. Dear God, right now, we are picking out persons one by one. Dear God, open their eyes. We're thinking of believers who haven't acted like believers. They've picked up the language of fear. They have set aside the language of faith and hope and life. They have set aside listening and they are no longer walking with Jesus. They are walking with panic. We pray that you would open their eyes, dear God. Open their eyes. Second person I want you to pray for is yourself. Maybe you're that person that needs your eyes open. Dear God, I pray for me. The whatever circumstances, whatever troubles, dear God, you often put us in places where it is troubled, it is broken. There are terrible things happening. There are uh, needs for God to arrive. And dear Lord, may I not show up without seeing what you are doing. Open my eyes, dear God. Open my eyes. Don't forget what God has done for you. One more thing, remember. One day here at New Hope Church, the most outrageous, beautiful miracle occurred. This is back in the days when Pastor Dave was our pastor and I ran to his office to tell him about what had occurred. And he sat down and we rejoiced together. And then he told me this, Tim, write it down. Because someday you're going to be struggling. Someday you're going to be depressed. Someday you're going to be having a difficult time. Get that memory out and remind yourself of what God has done. So I have assignment believers, pilgrims, sojourners, walkers uh, on this life. Write down your answers to prayer this week and put them in your Bible and make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Write down what God has done, what God has done. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw and beheld the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around. Can you imagine that moment? He's like, ah, no, no. Yea, though I walk to the valley of death, I'm going to get speared. You're right. And suddenly his eyes were opened, and he goes, we got this, right? He included himself in it, right? I know he did. Like, we got it. When he really shouldn't have, they got it, right? Those chariots. Your God is the almighty God of the impossible. Your God is still mighty to save. Your God can do miracles and answer prayer. Live by faith and not by fear. As our pastor says, God has got this. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you.